Well, I'm back, and I'm wearing a fourth shirt, but it is still only the third day of this video. I just had to change my shirt because my baby slobbered all over me. <laughs> so let's solder up the receiver. And I am going to be using a Crossfire receiver on this guy. Um, I've already soldered up the wires to the Crossfire receiver. This is the Crossfire Nano, and in case you've never done this before, the pinout is ground, 5 volts, TX, RX. I'm going to remember that yellow is TX, which is going to go to RX on the flight controller. TX goes to RX, RX goes to TX. Why do they do it that way? They just do. Now the receiver is made to be wired up right here on this flight controller. There's a TX and an RX and a few other useful pads for the receiver. There's also these. this front row of pins is for the buzzer and the um, infrared emitter. So, hmm... Should maybe do think about the buzzer and put a lost model buzzer on this. Hmm. Anyway, let's side this guy up. And the receiver is going to the back of the quad. It's a little, hmm, it's a little, hmm, that uh, they put the receiver pins on the front of the quad when the receiver usually goes to the back. But, you know, I guess they had to put it somewhere. I say they, it's really he, Dominic Clifton. Well, he's the guy who designed this. I guess he had to put it somewhere. So, okay. I mean, this is a pretty tight board, so. I don't like to run as many, I like to run as few wires as possible over the top of the flight controller because the battery step is gonna be going through there and like snagging on it, but I'll run it over the top, who cares? Yellow is TX goes to RX. White is RX goes to TX yellow. That's just how I happen to do it. By the way, that's not like a standard or anything. Uh oh, oh that's, there we go. There we go, good, that's decent. Camera's gonna go up front here. I bet there'll be room for a lost model buzzer back here. And the VTX will go in the back. It'd be cool to use like a 20 millimeter VTX. This frame has a 20 millimeter standoff location in the back. It would be kind of cool to use a 20 millimeter VTX, but I don't actually think I have one of those handy. So hmm, I'll just stick something back there. This right here is a lost model buzzer. And I recommend that you put this on every quad that you possibly can, really. Um, what this does, is, you can see it's got a little lithium battery here and it means that it charges itself up while you fly. And then when you crash and you can't find your quad anymore, you can make it beep. So this little guy will beep when you just trigger your quad's beeper mode, but it's way louder than the beeper that you're used to hearing. You can hear it from a much greater distance. If you've ever lost your quad in the tall grass and you've tried to use your regular little piezo beeper or the motor beeper, you could be 10, 15 feet from it maybe and not hear it depending on how much ambient noise there is. These guys are really freaking loud. In fact, they're so freaking loud that I complained that when you're just working on your quad on the bench and it goes it really is annoying and they actually changed it so like for the first 30 seconds of beeping it's quiet and then it gets louder very very clever very... i thought of that idea so i guess i shouldn't like compliment it too much or i'll sound like i'm patting myself on the back so um but if your battery ejects that's the other thing if your battery ejects this guy automatically starts beeping and it just keeps beeping until you find your quad so there is about 15 bucks which is not nothing but if it saves you from losing your quad, yikes, that's a big deal. Now, how are we gonna power this guy? Cause it needs buzzer plus, which is five volts, buzzer minus, which is switched to make the buzzer go off and ground, which it will just use to charge. It needs a ground to charge the battery through. Um, I think what I can do is we've got buzzer plus and buzzer minus here. And then this is the infrared emitter uh, for the, Older timings, today's race timing systems use the VTX as the emitter, the video transmitter. Older timing systems use infrared LEDs as the emitter, and I don't think I'm ever going to use that. So I'll use the ground from the infrared pad, and that's how I can wire this guy up. Joshua from the future here, what I just described to you does not work. If you check the wiring diagram linked down below, you'll see the correct way to do it. The issue is that the IR emitter negative pad is not just connected to ground. The IR emitter needs to be able to be switched on and off so it can basically be flashed at a certain frequency. And the flight controller does that by 
flashing the ground connection. So all, all this buzzer needs is just a straight ground connection. And in fact, when I plug it in, it doesn't really work. It makes a weird sound. I don't discover this until much later in the build. And what you'll see in the wiring diagram is that I end up using the nearby ESC minus pad. I don't know why I didn't do that to begin with because we're not actually using the ESC minus pads for anything, but you know, I was trying to be clever and keep the wiring neat. And anyway, don't use the IR minus pad, use the ESC minus pad as the wiring diagram shows. Okay. And what we've got here is yellow wire to buzzer minus or signal, red wire to five volts or buzzer plus. Those are actually the same thing and black wire to a ground. And there we go. That is set up. We got our receiver. We got our buzzer. Let's see. Let's plug this sucker in and see if anything goes poof. Looks good. Oh, bad. What are you doing? One of the things I like about the VFly Finder is there's a button on it to stop it from buzzing, going off of here. All right, this is the part where I will go ahead and bind my Crossfire receiver. Um, just easier to do while the quad is open. So what we'll do is I'm gonna go into the Crossfire, there we go. I'm gonna run the Crossfire Lua script here um, and I'm going to put it into binding mode and then I'm just going to plug in and oh excellent excellent I love that Crossfire does this the receiver knows that it's never been bound before so I don't have to push the button it just immediately as soon as it powers in goes hey anybody oh you want to bind and then boom we do a firmware update and just we're done love it People say, ooh, which has greater range, Crossfire or R9? And I'm like, you know what? I kind of don't care because, like, they can all go, I go two kilometers at most. But <laughs> the ability to just, boop, new firmware, binding, done, without ever having to get in there and fiddle with a button or, God forbid, plug into USB or something like that, huh, Crossfire. I have to say, FreeSky is adding over-the-air firmware updates to the new access protocol, um... It probably won't have any bugs right out of the gate. It'll probably work perfectly on day one. Is that it? Are we bound? The other thing I like to do is go into the Nano RX. Signal low. RX signal critical. No, come on. Let's start that nonsense. I go into the Nano RX and... We're going to... Set channel 7 to be LQ. That's how I set up all my quads. Channel 7 in, in Crossfire is LQ. That's how I get my LQ, my link quality, into the OSD. That's it. Now Crossfire is set up. Yeah, thank you. Crossfire is set up. The camera that we're going to use is the Runcam Phoenix. This is the Oscar Leong edition of the Runcam Phoenix. Um, Oscar helped Runcam design and tune this. And well, let's just see how it works in this build. I'm always up for trying something new. And I'm always up for supporting a great guy like Oscar. If you are wanting to learn about mini quads, but you don't like watching videos, you prefer to read, then Oscar Leong's website is an amazing, amazing resource. I'm very happy to see that this camera does support OSD control via UART. And the way that I know that is that it says G slash TX M slash RX here. If your Runcam camera has TX and RX on these last two pins, it means you can connect it to a UART on your flight controller and you can um, you can uh, access the menus in the camera. The same as if you had a little joystick, like, like this little joystick here, right? You could do that with your transmitter, though. And that's nice because you don't have to plug in a joystick. And it's also really handy that this flight controller has quite a few spare UARTs. To mount the camera, we're going to take the side plate and pass an M2 screw through it. These screws are included with the frame because um, the ones that come with your camera are not going to be the right length. The one that I have in my hand right now is also not the right length because I lost the ones that come with the frame, so I'm having to use my own. 
and the frame comes with this 3D printed adapter that takes the the width of the frame is too it's too wide to fit a micro camera, so this 3D printed adapter sort of shrinks down everything down, and lets you set the angle of the camera reliably. I am doing this backwards. I'm having a little trouble figuring out how this adapter is supposed to go onto the camera, right side up or upside down. If you put it this way, then there's no room to do any up tilt. So I'm going to guess that it's like this. I'm just to look forward and backward a little. I don't think it, no, it doesn't really move forward and backward once you've got it in there. That's interesting. So then why, oh, I guess it moves a little front and back when you change the angle. Interesting, although I'm not sure that's ideal. Well, anyway, let's just see how that goes. And I'll check with X hover to be sure I've done it correctly. <laughs> well, I just checked with X hover, and yes, that is, that is the correct way to do it. It's just a little fiddly, but there you go. It's interesting that changing the camera tilt angle does seem to move the camera slightly forward or backward. Oh, come on now. I wonder if that's like intentional for some reason that I'm not thinking of. Without the top plate being on, it's a little hard to manipulate these side plates without it all just sort of falling apart. I'm not sure how much tension we'll really be able to get here with these 3D printed threads. I guess it's going to hold though. This of course is going into the metal case or plastic case, whatever it is. So that's going to hold just fine. I've got it upside down. So here's the problem that I'm dealing with. I, th I think I figured it out. Notice that when I up tilt, the camera sticks out past the bottom of the plates, which would mean it's touching, or, or how it would have to go through the bottom of the, um, the bottom plate. But if you look here, you can see that this is not symmetrical. This plate here, you see this is, there's more distance here than there is here. So I've got these plates on upside down. So let's flip them over. Even when we do max up tilt on the camera, which is that's pretty substantial up to it looks like like 45 degrees easily which of course stingy being the power loop star he is he would he likes a little bit of extra up tilt but um it doesn't protrude through the bottom perfect yes yeah, so the camera plates can be put on upside down don't do that there we go got it okay Whew. okay nice let's do, let's solder up these wires to the flight controller didn't even need to do this, honestly. The freaking wires can go anywhere. Anyway, now the camera and the VTX headers are here on the flight controller. The camera header has video, ground, and power. And you recall we decided it, the camera was going to get 5 volts on the underside of the board. We soldered that solder bridge. The camera also has an OSD pad. And the, that doesn't have anything to do with Betaflight OSD. That is the camera control output. If you're going to have analog camera control the flight controller can attempt to emulate the joystick um, we're going to be using uart based digital camera control which is more reliable so we're not going to be using this pin instead we're going to connect the cameras tx and rx pat, uh, pins wires up to a uart but i'm going to get these three ready to go and yeah there's going to be plenty of room back here for this little guy to go in no problem there I like the fact that oh boy oh yeah I like the fact that he gave us uh, so flat solder pads here as well as through holes the through holes are freaking tiny going to be pretty challenging to solder to the solder pads are also freaking tiny and you can see I had a bridge there until I cleaned off the solder bridge so again reinforces my idea that this may not this exact flight controller may not be like the best choice for like your first flight controller I guess I could do it out the side but it'd be dumb because the wires are gonna go to the inside let's do it like this Oof. yikes I can do it I can do it I can do it Oof. Wow. <laughs> Man. <laughs> For this type of solder joint, 
I just like lay it flat in the position and just kind of touch with the iron and hope that it all comes together. It's just, there's just like no room to freaking work on these tiny, tiny pads. Oh, there we go. Got it. Just inspect that closely. The joints are secure. Man, that's fiddly. That is some fiddly, fiddly stuff. I gotta tell you. And then we got TX and RX here, which we're gonna have to go to a UART. And this is where we start seeing some of the limitations of this board because there are no more UARTs that have solder pads. And they got UARTs here with plugs, so okay, I guess, but I'd rather just solder these wires to a pad on the board. And the reason that, that I asked, actually asked Dominic about that, and he said the reason is that on a board this packed with stuff, there's just no room for additional solder pads. There's another flight controller the H70, which does not have a built-in PDB. So you would use it with a 4-in-1 ESC, like I'm doing. Why didn't he send me the H70? Well, he sent me this one. This one is more designed for use with individual ESC, so we got these giant ESC pads taking up all the room on the... There's nowhere to put those solder pads. So we will go ahead and we'll use a plug here. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to just take a... This is going to be UART 5 for the camera. Quick note, if you're following along at home, I ended up moving the camera control to a different plug on the board because it just got, there's one plug on the board that has two UARTs in it, UART 3 and UART 8. And I thought, well, I may as well minimize the number of plugs that I'm going to have. So if you're following along at home, it doesn't really matter where you put it, UART 5, UART 8, but you will see that the wiring diagram linked in the video description does not show the camera going where I have it here, and that's the reason for the discrepancy. I'll just plug that in there and fold it over this way and I'm do a wire splice here, which is unfortunate. But... So we don't need red and black. So as always when working with, as almost always when working with serial devices, TX goes to RX and RX goes to TX. I just checked the manual for this flight controller and this uh, wire here is TX, this is RX. So now we're gonna need to check the camera's pin out and we see that on the camera, it, RX is at the edge and TX is at the second to the edge. So we're gonna go TX is brown to RX is yellow. Oh, don't forget the, don't forget the heat shrink. Brown is TX to yellow is RX. Yep. This is such a pain in the, oh, I hate doing wire splices, you guys. They're so sloppy. They're so sloppy, honestly. I really dislike wire splices. <laughs> Idiot. I mean, each individual wire splice is not a big deal. But, like, when you have a lot of them, it's so cumbersome and ugly. It's just so ugly. I got that right and then we will give this some twists to help clean it up clean it up oh yeah that's not so bad good camera now we just got to do the VTX OMG we're almost done here well for certain values of almost done